So my novel uh, takes place in the North Woods of Wisconsin, which is slightly more north than where I live. I'm in central Wisconsin, and I'm going to read an opening section from chapter one, and then I'll, after this section, I'll read a, a tiny bit um, so you can get a flavor of another character's point of view just a little bit later. And the idea here is that this is a, a near future, somewhat somewhat of a dystopia, where um, the, the family in the novel has had to flee life in the city because of a lot of upheaval related to climate change. They think that they escape that by moving north to a rural place. But of course, years later, some of those same problems find them there. So this is the, the family and they are, they're now running a small fishing resort in Northern Wisconsin. Pencil, scissors, can opener. At first, the children's cries were only vaguely alarming. Allie heard the shrieks from inside pines, where the late summer breeze ferried their voices, isolated and individual, like lost birds or straggling summer tourists. The old cabin's wooden floor was strewn with the detritus of the project she'd begun at the start of the summer, more like a flood had washed through than a remodel was underway. A pulled cabinet perched atop the debris like a glacial sheaf ready to slide. Allie bent to extract one wooden handle from the rubble. Could this be the good hammer, subject these last months of a near manhunt in her household? Jackknife! Screwdriver! Another gust brought the children's voices as if offering guesses. Allie was in her 50s. She'd lived long enough, 18 years, in a rural northern county that she'd learned to guard her energy. Still, such screaming. She followed the cabin path to the resort's small beach, tapping the tool. She only frowned a little, noting a place at the path's edge where alternating rains and drought had nibbled. Thin strands of swaying grasses and the rash of spike rush that Allie was encouraging held everything, the small circle of their lawn with its swing set, horseshoe pits, and bonfire pit, from ruin. Reaching Maple's cabins, Allie understood that what had been nagging her in the children's cries. They weren't followed by splashes. Corkscrew, the girl called, twisting as she dropped, not into the water, glittering in the near distance with the inviting sheen of a line in Kugel's commercial, but from the top bar of the swing set. You supervising this? Allie turned to her daughter, Cassie. The woman she was becoming flickered like a strobe light beneath the girl she'd always been, the one who could track deer, wriggle a hook from a fish belly. Allie tapped the heavy tool she still carried against her thigh. Its mysterious end terminated in short, stubby spikes, each like a teenager's lip stud. Not well, Cassie answered, shrugging. Who are these children? Allie said. Little Eagle wasn't a large lake. In fact, Eagle's Nest was the only resort on it, unless you counted the very first place Old Ferdy, original proprietor, had attempted to build, the remnants of which lay directly across the water from their lawn and beach. Thousands of interconnected lakes pockmarked the north woods of Wisconsin. At its far narrow end, Little Eagle connected to Big Eagle Lake, though by low water in August, even kayaks in the narrow passage would tangle in the swirling weeds and knock against submerged rocks, especially these past August. Allie and her family had grown accustomed to meeting strangers in their yard, people who found their own way from the parking lot to their assigned cabin, or walked out on the dock before ambling up to Maples for official check-in. They didn't usually arrive by canoe, nor did children appear without adults. Allie scanned the water, but it lay flat and empty. Her daughter stretched her long legs and stood from the chair. Cassie often earned tips entertaining people's kids, more if they never discovered she was homeschooled. Then they thought she'd be impressed by a 20. Are you visiting someone on Big Eagle? Cassie addressed the boy. We saw the eagle. The boy avoided her eyes. Clearly siblings, the children had similar dark hair and eyes. Both wore swimming suits. The boys the baggy style that fell past his knees. The girls a one-piece with straps that crossed at the back, like the X-shaped bars that ordered marionette strings. For it being the end of summer, they seemed particularly pale. Video games, Allie figured. Can we go swimming? The boy asked. Kate always makes us wear our life jackets, said the girl, like if we're near water. Could we play with that paddle boat? The boy was already in motion, calling over his shoulder. The paddle boat had spent the summer tipped against the grass bank, its white belly a beached sea creatures, the flap of rudder in the crotch of its back nook, the comic completion. It has a leak, Allie said. 
But Cassie grinned. It's okay, I'll help them. Despite the money she made off their parents, just as often Cassie helped new kids by getting them soaking wet, tripped up in lake weeds, or turned around in the woods, shaking from stories of what might have been a bear or a crazy ex-lumberjack with a chainsaw. It was something Allie used to admire in her girl. She was fearless and reckless and playful. If lately the trait had come to seem like something other kids would have grown out of by now, by 18. Allie paused by the canoe, its seats a frayed lawn chair netting. Two pairs of battered high tops commingled in a puddle of water at the bottom. No life jackets. Still no sign of any adult in a second canoe out on the lake. She turned her back on the scene, taking her new tool up to the house. When they'd first come up here, Cassie only a heartbeat, already a heartbeat, highway billboards insisted, Allie had imagined a child who'd know which berries to eat in the woods, who would ski with her through the back country, all that snow falling with no notion as to border. Friends thought they were overreacting to leave the city, despite its heat waves and brownouts, water contamination and shootings. In response, Allie began saying she wanted to live less deliberately. In the story of her and Bud leaving the city, she became the one who wanted it most, pregnant and drawn to the woods and the wild. And it was true the city hadn't imploded behind them. People still lived and worked and shopped there, more or less as they always had, if masked from time to time, if required to carry documents. Two decades later, instead of a child who could navigate the L, Allie had a Northwoods girl. Give Cassie a wheezing car engine or outboard motor and she'd get in there with her bare hands and a screwdriver and nurse a sputtering turbine back to health. She baited hooks for thick-fingered tourists, for herself in winter, for lines dropped through holes in the ice. She used to be as good, too, with scaling and filleting. More often these days, with catch and release, guests were as satisfied anyway with the selfie as with the hors d'oeuvre. In Maples, Allie set the odd tool near the laptop. It had hiccuped all morning with incoming messages from guests trying to find their way, or who were just now as they were leaving wondering what to pack. Should they bring their towels? There was air conditioning, right? How were the cabins sanitized? She picked up the business cell to call Bud. Her husband had chosen this week of all weeks for a trip to Minneapolis. Need anything? Bud's voice tunneled through space. Allie didn't share what had become his nostalgia for city life, his occasional jones for a hip microbrew or new cannabis strain. He found traffic patterns interesting. So too drone surveillance and evacuation routes. Thought you were gonna be home by four. Bud said he should be back by then. Should? Where are you? A familiar silence interrupted her question. Hello? Allie spoke into the blankness. It wasn't their end, she knew. Not since last year when Cassie had ordered the new satellite system, set up the fancy modem. Now guests stalked about the front lawn of maples with their phones outstretched like water-witching dowels. Some believed the signal to be governed by the old horseshoe pit stakes, half hidden in the tall grass where the mower circled. What's going on? Bud asked when the signal resumed. Allie drew the curtain of the small window that looked toward the lake. Cassie and some new kids are playing with that old paddle boat. That's got a hole in it. Cassie knows. She's been the one saying she'll fix the thing. Allie peered through the window. That's what I should have picked up. Some fiberglass repair. Ostensibly, Bud had gone to the city for a gauge, something someone was selling online but for some reason couldn't ship, and which he needed for his latest project, home brewing. Not beer, but biodiesel. In the past, he'd involved Cassie in undertakings like these, her home-based education folded in with his lifelong one. But for half the summer, he'd been at work in the garage, tinkering, before Allie and Cassie knew what he was up to or how it was connected to the pretty lime slime that occasionally formed on their lake, floating from one end to the other. In Cassie and Allie's view, though even they didn't swim in the mass directly, the algae separated the real swimmers from the sissified. Isn't today the day you give Cassie her phone back? Allie had been about to accuse him of having forgotten the orchestra regrouped tonight, thus signaling the end of summer, an end of the orchestra mother's confiscations of their daughter's phones. It had turned out that even girls who sported shit kickers and badly cut fleet farm jeans could get up to trouble on social media. But Allie wondered if Cassie were ready to have hers back. She thought of the way she had greeted the new kids, something hard in her grin. Should have given it back weeks ago. Bud had been against the whole thing, a communal punishment like from the time of Salem. I don't think Christina ever had hers taken, he mumbled. 
Allie put the phone against the flesh of her arm, muffling it. She'd heard Christina, closest they had to a neighbor girl, Cassie's childhood best friend, had taken over her mother's job as a bartender at Tiki's, a half a mile away on their same side of Little Eagle. Allie didn't know what Bud thought he was doing bringing up either Christina or her mother, Shara. Did I lose you again? I think we should build a little porch off Pines. Bud sighed. You should see the porches on the new houses already going up along the river. Is that only as far as you are? There'd been mudslides along the St. Croix all spring, Minnesota and Wisconsin crumbling away from one another, like the eroding grass banks lining the cabin trail. I'm farther than that, he said. I'll be home soon. Guess we won't retire on a houseboat, though. Bud had a knack for circling back to his own subject. Did Allie know that one had been washed all the way to Missouri? One what? A houseboat. From the point of view of the people in it, looking out their curtain window as they floated downstream, it must have looked like the rest of the world was leaving them behind, rushing north. And then um, I'm going to skip a few pages and read a section that shows what um, Bud makes a stop on his way home. He doesn't come home directly. He goes to visit um, some other resort owners who are friends of theirs who own a similar kind of small fishing guest lodge. Their names are Kent and Kendra. And Bud gets a ride there with a, a young kid named BJ. BJ um, has a business um, helping uh, kayakers portage from one location to another. The large guest lodge that Kent and Kendra had built only five years ago rose three stories into the trees. A single car with North Dakota plates occupied the empty lot. The adult daughter, Bud thought, the geologist. Locals took turns reminding each other of her salary. Kendra's story of the Canadian oil company headhunting her. Before BJ hopped out to reclaim his truck and trailer, Bud had a question for him. If Kent closed on the 4th, what did he do with his existing reservations? BJ smiled. Hasn't he been sending people to you? Bud thought about that as he sponged his way over Kent's newly resodded lawn. Eagle's Nest had been booked these past two months, such that Allie believed all kinds of fantastical things, from the economy taking an upward tick to her new yellow flag at the top of their driveway drawing in more highway traffic. But if their nearest competitor had closed up shop mid-season with no warning, and that was the increase they'd seen, they were in more trouble than they knew. Kent sat on his lake-facing porch watching two children, grandchildren, dart across the lawn. I gave our young BJ a ride, Bud said. BJ had made his way down to the truck and trailer parked by the boat ramp. It would take him a few tries to back that thing out. You been getting our people, Kent asked? Think so. An empty chair sat next to Kent, but Bud stayed on his feet, near enough level with Kent for talking. He leaned an arm on the rail and took in the wool blanket spread over Kent's lap. It occurred to him that Kent might be sick, which wasn't something he'd thought on hearing of their sale, imagining their retirement. Italy, he'd thought. France. Kent and Kendra, the kind of people who might have managed to squirrel away that kind of money, even the kind of money such trips required now. His wife came from the house, screen door sighing before a final bang. Kendra marched past Kent and Bud toward the lake, only pulling up in her stride at its edge to holler across it. This is private property. You hear? Her shout reverberated over the dappled water. Her grandchildren kicked their soccer ball unfazed. In the distance, Bud could make out people in a small boat. We're getting them all the time these days, Kent said. Bud shaded his eyes. He hoped it wasn't anybody from one of the reservations that Kendra had just shouted at. BJ said all of his canoers were okay with you? The folks BJ brings are one thing. It's these others we get, Kent waved in a northern direction, toward the passageway BJ said he'd had cut through to the wolf tail. Who else is coming through? They come and go from both ways. Kent wasn't directly admitting he'd had the passage dredged. Poachers, Bud figured. Deer hunters who didn't see the need, herd sizes what they were and their family freezers empty, to wait for a special season. He had met those families during the year he'd been a librarian in wildfire, before that little place had closed. The ones who know what they're doing, the ones BJ brings, they're fine. Too many others just hike on in without the right gear. We've seen them come out half-starved, soak through, wearing tennis shoes full of holes, or out with kids like that. Kent stopped, likely recalling that Bud had homeschooled his daughter. You should see what they leave. Crap floats up on the beach. Clothes, plastic trash, diapers. Bud could hear Allie's uh, opinion on that. 
cars and people on the old road she was trying to grow over in a habitat for pollinators. His wife was another one who believed the flapping butterfly wings of her own actions could have effect on the world, as little as she otherwise wanted to venture into it or take part in it. Oh, BJ's backpackers are different, Kent said. Doctors, lawyers, CEO types. They compete in these outdoor adventure races. Sometimes they're out for days, running and canoeing, carrying their bicycles on their back. They try to carry as little as possible, BJ said. One girl I picked up, I thought they should bring her to the hospital. He'd missed Kent's earlier complaints. Kendra crossed to join them. She wore a pink tank top, white shorts and no shoes, trailing her toes in the grass as if she were a young girl enjoying summer break, not as if she'd just hollered at someone, possibly native someone's, to get off her lake. You tell him the good news yet, she said to her husband. BJ told me most of it, Bud said. Congratulations. Sometimes you're in the right place at the right time, Kent said. Bud thought about the houseboat he'd seen on the river, the one he'd tried to explain to Allie on the phone. What would it be like to live in a house that floated? You could move so that you were always in the right place at the right time. You could move fast enough, which was how people had to move these days. Thank you.